Geothermal energy is the thermal energy generated and stored in the earth, derived from the Greek words G and thermos, meaning earth and heat respectively. Some of this heat, around 5 to 10 percent, was produced when the earth was formed millions of years ago. But most of it comes from the decay of naturally radioactive materials, such as uranium and potassium, and is so continually renewed. The planet is made up of different layers, a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, mantle and crust. We live on the crust and temperatures vary greatly depending on the seasons and surrounding air patterns. But the temperature 10 to 20 meters below the surface is a constant 25 degrees year round, regardless of these factors. High temperature geothermal energy is sourced from the regions around tectonic plate boundaries where volcanic and seismic activities are lively. This means the Earth's crust is fractured which allows the geothermal energy to be readily accessible. This picture from the International Geothermal Association gives an overall view of the layout of these plates and where the highest concentrate of geothermal energy is available. The Union of Concerned Scientists America estimates that within 10,000 metres of the Earth's surface is more than 50,000 times as much energy as the combined resources of oil and natural gas. Remembering that geothermal energy is naturally renewable, it is theoretically everlasting. There are two main geothermal resources. The first is hydrothermal resources that allow us to utilise the heat from natural convective water. This resource is broken down into three sections, high temp circulating fluid, deep aquifer system and warm water from oil and gas production. High temperature circulating fluid resources absorb heat from the core of the earth and come out through wells to the surface in the form of steam and steam water mixture. While this type of resource offers high temperature and accessibility without drilling, most geothermal vents are located under the sea and technology needs to be developed for commercial use of these offshore geothermal resources. Deep aquifer systems can be reached within three kilometers of the Earth's crust and offer moderate heat flow. Warm water is a byproduct produced from wells when oil and gas is exploited and efficiently and economically implemented to produce electricity and other forms of energy. The second type of geothermal resource is hot rock. Hot rocks store heat to be used but have low permeability and porosity which means they need to be fractured so water can go through the cracks and collect the heat stored within them. EGS, enhanced geothermal systems, causing fracture to artificially creating water circulating loops is a well-known technology which allows us to utilize the heat from the hot rock resources. These maps show the distribution of both convective hydrothermal reservoirs and deep aquifer systems across the globe that can be readily accessed for adaption or conversion to human needs. To tap into geothermal reservoirs, we need to survey and drill into appropriate sites. The depth and number of bores required depend on both the location and the intended use of the site. A whole drill for the purpose of accessing a geothermal reservoir is called a well. In conventional rotary drilling, an oil and gas well drilling rig is used. The geological conditions involved in drilling geothermal wells are generally harsher when compared to with standard oil and gas wells. The well is drilled by using a rot rotaring drill bit. The drill bit is attached to a pipe or drill string and is lowered through the rock formations towards the reservoir. Drilling fluid called mud or air is circulated down the drill string and back up the drill hole to flush out the rock cuttings. Due to the high temperatures involved, conventional drill bits are subject to increased wear which increases the cost of drilling operations. Novel techniques such as laser drilling are being developed Laser drilling involves a laser to thermally spool, chip, melt or vaporize rock. Once the well is drilled to a predetermined depth, a steel pipe called a casing is placed inside the hole and cement, cemented in place. This isolates various pressure zones from each other and the surface. 
The wall can then be drilled deeper with a smaller bit and casing. Once the wall has been drilled to a suitable depth, the reservoir can be accessed. Depending on the nature of the resource, a number of production and reinjection wells may need to be drilled. After drill is complete, the desired equipment and facility can be built for energy adaption. Geothermal resources can be used to generate electricity by expanding a vapour through a turbine. The turbine is then connected to a generator, which produces electricity for distribution. Three main configurations can be adapted depending on the type of geothermal resource being used. In vapour dominated resources, also known as dry steam or direct steam, pressurised steam is piped directly from wells to a power generation plant where it is expanded through a steam turbine. From the turbine, the steam travels through a condenser, and the condenser is often re-injected into the subterranean aquifer. These types of plants are less common due to the rare nature of the suitable vapour-dominated resources. In a steam flash power plant, hot fluids reach the surface through a production well and are piped into a separator. The reduction in pressure causes some of the water to flash into steam. The steam is then fed through a turbine, condensed and, and further re-injected for use again. Both dry steam and flash steam power generations require geothermal resources which are quite hot. A significant number of geothermal resources are lower in temperature and cannot be used to generate enough steam for water to operate these times of plant. These resources can still be used to produce electricity in a binary power plant, also known as an organic Rankine cycle power plant. A binary system uses a separate working fluid with a lower boiling point, such as ammonia, propane, isobutane and isopropanone. The heat from the geothermal resource is transferred into the binary fluid using a heat exchanger. The geothermal fluid is then returned to the aquifer via re-injection wells and never comes in contact with the turbine. When the binary fluid is heated, it flashes into vapour which is then used to drive a turbine. The binary fluid is condensed and used repeatedly in a closed loop. The real beauty of using geothermal energy though is that it can be used to achieve the direct result of a desired energy rather than producing only electrical energy and then converting it again. With drilling of shallow wells and the adoption of a heat pump system, you can easily achieve adaption of earth energy produced energy. This energy can be used for the heating of water, for showers and cleaning, and adapted together with an air handler for the cooling and heating of dwellings depending on the current season and outside temperature conditions. Almost 10% of New Zealand's electricity is sourced from geothermal energy due to its abundance throughout both islands. It can be used in any industrial process that requires large amounts of continuous energy. One of New Zealand's largest industrial users of geothermal energy is the Tasman Pulp and Paper Mill. The plant was built in the late 1950s on top of an active geothermal field and the heat is used in digesting wood pulp, drying timber and paper and generating the site's electricity. The world's first and only geothermal prawn farm was established in the late 1980s near one of New Zealand's geothermal power stations. Hot water from the power station is used to keep the water warm for the prawns and to reduce the amount of heat pollution in the local river system. One of the many uses of geothermal energy is for heating greenhouses. It has proved popular in the extreme latitudes of Northern Europe, North America, South America and New Zealand, where there are large changes in temperature throughout the year. This makes it possible to grow many different types of fruits and vegetables while minimising the effect of the outside temperature. One perfect example is Iceland. This country spends most of the year covered in snow with three months of darkness and three months of sunlight, making it hard for anything to grow. Geothermal power district heating is common in some areas of Europe where it is used to heat footpaths and major centres like hospitals, runways and some motorways. 
This is a cost-effective way of heating large areas throughout the winter months. The Netherlands is one country that is going towards using geothermal energy to heat up footpaths during the winter months. The cost of producing electrical energy varies not just between sources, but also in setup and maintenance costs. The main advantage with renewable energy is that the technology to harness is constantly increasing, where in contrast, the cost of fossil fuels are constantly increasing. As with all renewable energy, the cost of setting up the station, and in the case of geothermal, drilling wells, incurs the greatest cost, averaging to about two-thirds of the overall expenditure during the life of the facility. As you can see in this chart from California Energy Commission, the cost of geothermal is quite favorable when compared to other renewable sources and as the technology to drill and harness heat increases, will continue to come down. The installation of shallow geothermal systems and the adoption of readily available heat for hot water and HVAC systems is also quite cheap in comparison to today's energy prices. The Daily Green estimates that these systems can be installed for 42,000 US dollars and is shown to have a possible payoff period as short as three years with saving of up to 69,000 US dollars over the life of the system based on 20 years usage. To add in the factor of carbon to the cost of electricity and heat production in relation to the environmental impact as seen in this chart, the International Energy Agency has found geothermal to be the absolute cheapest and will remain in the three lowest for many years to come. Geothermal power stations are still susceptible to producing unwanted emission and pollution, but with the correct installation can be kept to a minimum or eliminated altogether. As most systems use water or steam from the earth, these elements can contain high levels of hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and methane. With the use of closed-loop systems, all these elements return safely back into the earth to be heated for use again and again, with the only possible pollution coming from leaks or breaks due to warm parts or poor maintenance. In open-loop systems, these toxins can be released into the air at about an average of 0.1 kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. To put this into perspective, a natural gas and coal power station produces 0.3 to 1 kilogram and 0.7 to 1.5 kilogram, respectively. The main problem with geothermal energy is that it uses the Earth's natural heat and will eventually cool to a point where it isn't feasible if the rate of regeneration is lower than that used. Stations can be cycled to allow the heat to naturally return if required, but this downtime needs to be factored into the cost per kilowatt. Land use for the power stations are similar to conventional stations fired by fossil fuel energies, with the fact that emissions are extremely small to zero, towns can be built around or close to the site reducing the environmental and cost impact of transporting electricity over long distances. HVAC geothermal systems can be built right below establishments 
eliminating the need to transport and reducing the reliance on current power lines and the need to upgrade to meet growing energy demand. According to Key World Energy Statistics 2012 prepared by the IEA, renewable energy resource including geothermal, solar, wind, heat, etc. accounts for only 0.9% of the world's total primary energy supply in 2010. While 0.9 is a small percentage, demand for geothermal energy and its technology development are increasing for its abundant, clean and renewable characteristics. And geothermal energy is projected to provide 1,400 terawatts per hour annually for global electricity consumption in 2050, as the IEA describes in Technology Roadmap Geothermal Heat and Power. The top 10 countries for geothermal installed capacity ranking in 2010 are the US, Philippines, Indonesia, Mexico, Italy, New Zealand, Iceland, Japan, El Salvador and Kenya in the order of 1st to 10th. This table was created based on the data in 2012 from RenewableFacts.com and the data in 2001 from Low Enthalpy Geothermal Resources for Power Generation and it shows the situation of geothermal energy in the countries listed on the scope of this project one. It is interesting to compare each country's data and see the differences among those countries. For example, the US has the most final installed geothermal capacity of 3,386 megawatts, but geothermal energy accounts for only 0.2% of the total installed capacity, while Indonesia has less final installed geothermal capacity of 1,339 megawatts, but geothermal energy accounts for as much as 3.62 of the total installed capacity. Pros and cons. In summary, geothermal energy is very cost effective compared to all other energies, fossil and renewable. Has low to no greenhouse emissions, readily available worldwide in many different forms, many options to harness, many different ways to the heat energy can be utilised, enough reserves for millions of years to come, is con constantly renewing, can be difficult to drill, still has some emissions if not using an enclosed system, can deplete local heat reserves and power stations are hard to relocate if required.